but I'm going to introduce our product. So welcome to Assisi Animal Health CE in today's presentation, New Tools for Old Problems, Non-Pharmaceutical Anti-Inflammatory Devices. Our presenter today is Dr. Lori McCauley, who received her DVM from uh, Colorado State University. She is certified in acupuncture, chiropractic, canine rehabilitation, and she is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. She uh, owned, operated, and was the medical director of Topps Veterinary Rehabilitation up until 2017 when she moved to North Carolina and has opened Red Tail Rehab in uh, nearby North Carolina, again, the owner and medical director. She had the honor of receiving the AARV Award for Excellence in the Field of Rehab, that's the American Association of Rehab Veterinarians, and in 2015 was awarded Holistic Practitioner of the Year by the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. She is well known to many of us, and we look forward to hearing what she has to say about new tools for old problems. Welcome, Dr. McCauley. Thanks, Carolyn. Hopefully we'll have lots of fun. Hope so. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get this puppy going. Oh, there we go. All right, so thank you to Assisi for sponsoring this, Continuing Education. Love to get Continuing Education. And we'll keep going. So, all right, so the first thing I want to talk about is what I look at as the veterinarian's job. One of our big things is treating pain and inflammation. And in the olden days, we used to have drugs, right? Well, there's always cases where drugs aren't enough or drugs can't be, be given if they have liver problems. And sometimes nowadays we have clients who say, you know what, I don't want drugs, especially dealing with like the opioid situation, right? We know what it can do. And there's more and more research coming out that's saying that, especially in dogs, that it actually has a negative effect in the long run versus a positive. Um, we also want to increase healing and decrease inflammation. So let's talk about inflammation for a minute. So many things happen, you know, we may see swelling or there may be stiffness, we feel it in ourselves, but that fluid, when we talk about inflammation, that's fluid in the interstitial space, right? We know that logically, but we have to think about, well, what exactly is that doing in the body and why do I care about it? Well, think about every nerve in the body at every single synapse, if we have increased fluid in that area, inflammation, it actually dilutes out all those neurotransmitters. So every signal that that nerve is passing from one nerve to another has less of an impact on the nervous system. It, so the body is getting less messages in everything that we're doing. One of the more common things that we think about is in joints, but it's more than just, oh, there's inflammation, right? So we can have inflammation on the inside, the outside. But if you think about it, if we look here, the cells on the inside of the joint capsule are one that make inflammatory mediators so it affects the fluid and the cartilage a lot um, we can have inflammation in the joint capsule so we have thickening and that's where we see stiffness but when we have inflammation in here one of the things we need to think about is our little chondrocytes so in our cartilage only 20 percent of that cartilage is cells so 80 percent is matrix and those cells are not at the top. Actually, there's more and more cells at the bottom next to the subchondral bone than there are at the top. And the way that they get their nutrition, so cartilage is avascular, right? It doesn't get a blood supply, is we have load, which pushes the fluid out between, within the, the matrix. And then it is um, negatively charged and it grabs onto the positively charged molecules that are being released from the synovial capsule, the nutrition for those cells. And then when load is removed, that, uh, that nutrition goes back to those cells and that's how they are fed. Well, when we deal with inflammation, wow, those cells are not putting out a lot of nutrition and we have less and less nutrition to those chondrocytes. So we have cells and we can get anything from fissures and cracks, swelling in the, the matrix, to actually hibernation or where that is almost bone, right? So inflammation can have a big part of it. And it's not just when it's at the end stage, but we can affect inflammation at the very beginning. 
So we shouldn't necessarily think just about treating dogs that have significant pain, but what about treating them before that pain is created when we see just thickening of the joint capsule or um, inflammation because we have a little bit of uh, effusion or edema in the area. So much more than just joints, right? Anytime we lift a dog's lip and we see red gums, that's inflammation. Now think about if your gums were bright red, you know that would be uncomfortable. Just because the dog's not eating doesn't mean they're not uncomfortable. Anal glands, right? We see so many little dogs with anal glands and they don't even have to have abscesses. If they're scooting, they're not scooting to communicate. They are communicating, but it's not why they're doing it. They're communicating to us saying, hey, mom, this is a problem. It hurts. They're doing it to try to express their anal glands because it hurts. We can help with that. Ears. How many times do we see dogs shaking their head? They're not shaking their head to say, hey, mom, can you look at my ears? They're saying, it hurts and I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to scratch it. Every hot spot that we see, right? Anything that's red, inflammation, they scratch it, not just to annoy us so we don't sleep, right? They scratch because it hurts and they're trying to make it feel better. And it's not just on the outside. Let's talk about inflammation on the inside. Think about a dog with laryngeal paralysis, right? I used to live in Chicago. These guys, they would, they'd be doing okay. They're compensating. They'd go outside in the summer. It's hot. It's humid. And, <gasps> right? They'd get that strider going. They'd have trouble breathing. If we can decrease the inflammation, and my personal assistant had a dog with laryngeal paralysis, a, a golden retriever, and she was on a blog. And actually, they talked about using PEMF, CC, loops, and keeping it in their little therapy bag. So if something happens and they're out and there's a problem, they can throw it over the dog's head and within a couple minutes, they're breathing better. Okay, let's keep going. And this is more specific, more sensitive. Um, pulmonary fibrosis. If we have inflammation and scar tissue in the, now I'm not saying it's going to get rid of scar tissue, but it is going to help with the inflammation. Um, the dogs breathe better when they have the loop or the PEMF on, placed on their lungs multiple times a day. I can tell you personally, I had the flu a couple years ago. And now, I've been a vet since 92. And I've missed two or three days of work in those 28 years. I was homesick. Well, that, so it gives you an idea of just how sick I was. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm a little bit type A anal. I can't lay here in bed all day. This is crazy. Uh, but I was coughing and my nose was all stuffy. And I'm like, okay, you're a scientist. How can you fix this? And I'll be honest, I hate to take drugs. And uh, I'm a little bit of a nerd. So I reached into my nightstand table and pulled out my stethoscope and went, <sighs> I have crackles in my lungs. That's not good. And I, um, I use my CC loop and I put it around my head like uh, around my nose and 15 late minutes later my nose was draining and I'm like oh that's really cool and then I put it on my chest twice one on the left one on the right and then one on my back and I listened to my chest again because I'm a scientist right I want to know what changes are and my crackles were gone I'm not saying this is going to help with COVID but I'm thinking this is pretty darn cool for getting rid of inflammation in the chest all right moving on to pancreatitis we know those dogs hurt I mean, we've all had stomach issues, where it, whether it be a, um, a colitis or a um, inflammation in the pancreas or the stomach. Uh, we can take away the inflammation or decrease it and decrease the pain. And then kidneys. How many times do we have kidney cats, right? Or dogs with kidney issues where we have a nephritis, itis, inflammation. If we can decrease the inflammation, make blood flow go through easier pull those toxins out of the body, we can increase quality of life as well as decrease inflammation and pain. So the name of the talk, NPEDS, non-pharmaceutical anti-inflammatory devices. Now it's put on by a CC, so we're gonna talk a lot about PEMF, but I also wanna talk a little bit about laser because that is a device that decreases pain and inflammation. And there is a lot of research on it. And again, with both of these, um, a huge, proponent of multimodal medicine, right? So we want to use as many, mm, we want to use multiple things to get the best effect. And then my rule is get your effect and then peel things back so you can use the least amount of things to have the best result. 
So what about some other things? Um, what isn't an NPED? Well, TENS, a TENS unit is great for helping with pain, but I haven't seen any um, science behind decreasing inflammation. So I'm not talking about that. Acupuncture, I love it for pain and inflammation, but it's not really a device. Exercise and manual therapy, absolutely great for pain and inflammation, but they're a technique, not really a device. So we're not gonna talk about them. So let's talk about laser for a second. Some local effects. We know it affects the calcium ion balance. Um, so it changes cell membranes. Um, it changes things in the muscle. Uh, it affects the cell cytochrome respiration. So that is the respiration going on in the mitochondria. So remember, um, aerobic activity increases, uh, takes fat, and makes lots and lots of ATP. Well, laser affects the respiration, so that goes faster at low doses, at low doses. So it helps healing, right? We know that it decreases edema. I've put my laser on many a patient and had the client feel, feel how big and thick this is, boop, 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 play with the laser, and then it's smaller. Um, effusion, with my laser, I can have a patient feel stifle effusion and treat it, and immediately I go from a convex surface to a concave surface. Well, not immediately, but a couple minutes. Uh, we know from the research it decreases COX-2, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosing factor, PGE2-alpha. Um, it generates uh, reactive oxygen species, which are messengers to help decrease inflammation. And the big thing, it increases short levels of, I'm sorry, increases levels of short bursts of nitric oxide. Why do we need to talk about that? We're going to get to that in just a minute. Big picture, small doses decreases inflammation um, and speeds healing with laser. Big doses decreases pain. What's the difference? Remember we talked about that mitochondria? Well, at low doses, we're, slow, we're increasing the respiration. More ATP is produced. Woohoo, the cell can do whatever it needs to do. At high doses, we actually shut that respiration down. Well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if pain is your problem, it's a really good thing because in the nerve cells, we're stopping those, that ATP from coming out so that cell cannot send a transmission from the nociceptor, the mechanoreceptor um, at the, the, the surface level or where the pain is up to the spinal cord, up to the brain. Right? So knowing what your, your abilities are and how to use them can give you really good results. So you can say, okay, really cool. Um, if I have a laser, do I need both? Like, granted, you know, multimodal is nice, but do they have different effects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I think about is I can do the laser in my clinic, send my patients home with a loop, and then they can do it at home between visits, right? Because they can't come in every day or every other day. Um, the other thing is that they can use, be used synergistically. I have lots of patients that are using the loop um, that come to me and they say, okay, well, it's not enough. Let's do more stuff. Or, hey, I use the loop. My dog got hurt on Friday. I'm coming in on Monday. Uh, what more can we do? Um, what we, we need to realize is both affect the nitrous oxide system. So it's not going to hurt to do both at the same time, but we're not going to get maximum effect. We actually, when we, hmm, when we stimulate that nitric oxide system, we actually have a cascade reaction that's going on in the body, and that effect lasts about two hours. It takes two hours to have full effect. So what we want to think about is if we're using laser and PEMF, we want to separate them by two hours. Not that it's going to hurt anything, but we want to get maximum effect of one and then maximum effect of the other. And they both have other modes of action, just those two over that nitrous oxide overlaps. The other nice thing about a PEMF is that it can treat through bone. So if you have a fracture, it can treat through a bandage. It can treat through thick coats. You don't have to worry about things heating up. And it got its FDA clearance on people with cancer, which is something that I consider laser as um, 
uh, used with caution, right? So it can be used palliatively, but we know that it can increase cancer growth. So what does it look like? Well, here's what an Assisi loop looks like, right? We have the little package here. We know that it creates a pulsed electromagnetic field and the therapeutic range, um, Assisi says is about eight to 10 now, I say that, and I put my little hang 10 sign up here, because for me and most people, now I'm not a basketball player, from the end of your pinky to the end of your thumb is about seven inches. So for most people, I say, you know what? If you have the loop on an area, imagine your thumb to pinky distance going up. It's treating that far going up and that far going down. So it gives people a visual of this barrel shaped field and exactly what am I treating? Now, it's a magnetic field. It's not like it just poof, goes away, right? It actually just gets less and less and less and less. So we still have the most effect right at the center of the loop, but we have a therapeutic effect getting less and less and less. Eight to 10 inches, or for me, my safety thing is, okay, I know I'm getting um, at least with seven inches. So let's talk about some history of pulse electromagnetic field. If you've ever been to an acupuncture or a chiropractor or somebody who has had you lay down face down and they put this thing over you and they walk out of the room for 10 minutes and your back gets nice and warm, even through your clothes. What that is is diathermy. In the 1930s, scientists came up with a radio frequency electromagnetic device that they would turn on and it created deep heat. It feels really good. But then they said, you know, this is really cool. Um, we're using it for wound healing and pain, but what happens if we don't want heat? If we have active inflammation, how can we change the variables, right? Lots of variables and see what else it can do. Well, in the 1970s, they changed the variables and said, oh, cool, look at this. This is a bone growth stimulator. It got its FDA clearance um, for use of delayed and non-union fractures. And people use it to this day, right? They're on it at least 12 hours a day, and it still takes months to heal, but it takes a delayed or non-healing fracture and makes it heal. Well, in the 1990s, um, there was uh, Louis Ignar Ignario who said, you know what, nitrous oxide's really cool. Let's see what we can figure out about it. It's actually the only um, cell messenger that is gaseous rather than a uh, chemical. Um, and he said, okay, look, this does really cool stuff. He won a Nobel Prize finding its effects on vasodilatation and inflammation. He said, let's use that for treating soft tissue. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Arthur Piller said, hey, that's really cool stuff. How about if we use the PEMF and find out what the best variables are different than diathermy, different than the bone growth stimulator, to have the most effect on nitrous oxide. Well, that's when they did these studies and the study that got it, it its FDA clearance found that not only did it decrease pain and, and edema, it reduced the opioid use. This is a double blind placebo controlled randomized study by 50%. It's huge. It was a great enough study that it was actually covered by Medicare. Um, they also found that when they looked at the pathways for nitrous oxide, that the targeted PEMF, and you'll hear me say that because that's that set of variables, affects, non, affects the tissue significantly more than non-targeted PEMF. Now, the PEMF in general doesn't have any adverse effects or side effects, which is really, really cool. But let's look at science, right? Because it's really cool to know not just, oh, this is great for pain and edema, but what is it doing in the body? And again, this is just one mode of action. We know that PEMF, because that's what they did the study with, increases calcium and calmodulin binding, which then combines with endothelial nitrous oxide synthetase to create the short bursts of nitrous oxide. So what does that do? Well, within 
seconds, we start to get anti-inflammatory effects. So we have increased blood flow, increased lymph flow, decreased pain and edema, but more things than that happen. It starts other cascades. So we start to see um, cyclic GMP, which are our growth factors, and that can have effects for hours to days our vascular endothelial growth factors. So we have angiogenesis, so we're getting more blood flow and more blood vessels to the tissue. Our fibroblast growth flat factor, so we're getting more collagen, granulation, and healing in the tissue. And our transforming growth factor, so we get remodeling. And that can have effects for weeks. We're gonna look at some research that, that shows that, which is really, really cool. Now, remember we said that there's different variables. So some of the variables for a CC is their um, 27.12 megahertz carrier wave, kind of cool. Um, that was uh, one that showed that it had the most ability to bring that um, pulse electromagnetic field into the tissue. Uh, we have two millisecond pulse width, uh, two hertz pulse frequency, and I'm going to show you at the end a paper by Jamie Gaynor, who's one of, to me, the pain management gurus, who said that comparing targeted pulse, pulse magnetic field therapy to non-targeted, that the targeted had a sevenfold greater effect really, really cool. So it's basically a very, very efficient way to bring healing to the tissue. So give you an idea, I'm a visual person. If I look at this graph, this is what a bone growth stimulator field or um, wavelength looks like, right? So we have a lot of variables that are very, very different from the Assisi waveform. And it has a very, very different effect. I wouldn't use this for some of the things I would use this for and vice versa. I'm study driven, so I love to look at studies. I'm gonna show you two studies that are very, very similar. One looking at non-targeted PEMF and the other looking at targeted PEMF. And they're, they're both really recent. I, I usually put the, um, the date uh, highlighted so it's easy to see. So this was non-targeted PEMF, um, osteoarthritis with stifles or knees in humans, right? Both of them are in that general category. Um, and what they found with 12 hours a day, they had a reduction in pain, so visual VAS, visual analog scale, by 25%. Now that's pretty good. So that's taking your pain level from an eight to a six, right? That's pretty good. In fact, it was so good that 26% of the patients were able to get off NSAIDs being treated 12 hours a day. Now let's look at targeted PEMF. Now we're treating 30 minutes a day, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. Again, these is humans with osteoarthritis and pain. Um, what they found there is with the visual analog scale that it decreased, school, it decreased their pain by 50%. So instead of it taking from an eight to a six, we've now taken it from an eight to a four. And instead of being 12 hours a day, we're at 30 minutes a day. And a great study, right? So our double blind placebo control, controlled randomized study when they compared it to the sham, the sham had no difference in visual analog scale, right? So no decrease in pain. That's a good study. But let's keep looking, right? So this is a study, if you had questions about it and you wanted to look it up, um, that it got its FDA clearance for. Had significant, so this is women that had breast reduction with cancer and they um, had, it was double blind placebo controlled. Uh, they did the mastectomies and then it was in a bandage. And what they found was decreased inflammation, uh, significantly less drainage in the drainage that they got, significantly less interleukin 1B, which is the uh, inflammatory media that they were looking at. Huge, about a 50% reduction in narcotic usage. It was a 2010 study. Okay, that's really cool, people, but let's talk about dogs for a minute. This was a canine osteoarthritis study looking at 20 days of PEMF compared to 20 days of an appropriate level of Prevacox and looking at pain. What they found with both subsets, so the Prevacox dogs and the PEMF dogs, is both had significant improvement in pain and functionality during the study. Difference being is once the study ended, so it was only 20 days, the dogs that had had pre, uh, the Prevacox, eh, they started to have problems again within a few days. 
the dogs that had had the PEMF actually still had significant pain relief, not only four months later, but 12 months later. One thing I do want to note is if you're using a PEMF device for osteoarthritis, it can take up to three weeks to have full effect. So it's not a, you know, it's a chronic problem. It's going to take a little bit of time to get that tissue to decrease inflammation and start to heal. Remember, we said some of those effects takes days to weeks to have full effect. Let's look at some rat studies. Poor rats, right? They, they use rats because it's a very consistent effect. If I take, in this case, carrageen and inject it into the rat's paw, I know it's going to swell up to X size and it's going to be X amount of painful. So they did this and then half of the rats they put in a box with um, an CC loop and half of them they put in a box without therapy and then they looked at it. And what they found that the rats that had the actual treatment had much, much less pain and edema than the control group. Okay, that's, that's a cool study. I like this one. They cut, yeah, sorry, poor rats. They cut the Achilles tendon and they sewed it back together. And then they treated twice a day for three weeks. And then they, sorry rats, euthanized the rats and they hooked the tendon up to something that pulls it apart to see how much tension, how much tensile strength it has before it pops. And what they found is that the rats that had the um, ACC treatment actually had 69% more tensile strength. That's huge. So for my patients that tear a cruciate ligament, an Achilles tendon, anything like that, I definitely want to get them on PEMF therapy to help it heal significantly faster. Here's more studies looking at pain and inflammation um, compared to sham. So again, in rats, it's, it's a nice visual, right? So here we have 100% um, pain inhibited in the active group. Um, here we have 61% less edema than the sham group. This is a fun one. This is angiogenesis. Again, a great visual, right? These are rats that they took a skin flap and they put this little tubing in and they said, okay, let's shut, close up the flap. Half of them get PEMF, half of them don't get PEMF. Um, and that they found was the rats that had the actual PEMF therapy, 500% increase in neovascularization and the flap survived. The rats that did not have the actual therapy, did not have the neovascularization or significantly less, and the flaps died. So cool study. More studies. Um, this one more specific. This is the Achilles tendon one, but this is a nice one because it looks at cutaneous wounds. So skin wounds heal 59% faster. All right, fun stuff. This is just from like a year or two ago. Um, in North Carolina States, woohoo, that's where I'm living now is North Carolina. Um, Dr. Uh, Olby did a great study. She took grade five IVD dogs, so I can't walk dogs. Um, double blind placebo controlled randomized study. And they had either a sham device or a active device and they had treatment um, every two hours for the first week and then they went home and they had it continuing and what they found was that the incisional pain was significantly less in the patients. They had increased proprioception and as time went on that was more and more. Um, but the big thing was they had significantly less GFAP. So what's GFAP? It's a neurological marker for injury. So the more nerve injury you have, the more GFAP you have in the tissue. So there was a lot less, significantly less GFAP in the patients that had the active ACC loop. That's pretty cool, it's neuroprotective. Another study, this is done by my friend Leilani at AMC in New York. Uh, they also did dogs with IVDD that had surgery and they looked at, um, they looked at wound healing. They found that the dogs that had the active loop, another double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study, 
uh, had significantly better wound healing. They had no side effects. And the big thing here is they looked at how much drugs the dogs needed. And they found just like in the human mastectomy studies, 50% reduction approximately in the dogs that had the active loops. 50% less pain meds needed. Huge. So when do I use this? Anything with inflammation. And I highlighted some of these. I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, but I want you to think about some of them. So biceps brachii tendinopathy. I'm a rehab vet, right? So I see that a lot. That's a great thing. I had a uh, friend call me and say, hey, I've got this cat with cerebellar abiotrophy. Like, well, okay. I haven't seen more than one of them. Um, but it's an inflammatory thing. And I you know, she had tried everything. She had looked in all the neuro books. It had been diagnosed by a, neurolog a board of neurologist. I said, I think it has an inflammatory component. Why don't we try the ACC loop? And sure enough, called me back like two weeks later and said, within three days, the cat's doing better. Oh my God, this is amazing. The owner absolutely loves this and will continue on it doing great. Um, cystitis, conjunctivitis, dental extractions, fractures, Cervical disc disease, they makes a great little collar. FCPs, leg calf perthes, right? Some of these patients you can't touch. This helps. Lick granulomas, IBD. Lumbosacral pain. I can tell you I use mine in my car when I'm driving, case from house to house. Seromas works really well with seromas. Um, just recently had a patient, a German shepherd that had lumbosacral uh, stenosis in surgery and had a nasty seroma. Um, and using that in hot packs went down, all the fibrous tissue went away. We used laser too, um, did great. Spinal stenosis, sinusitis, wounds. Okay, I don't have the information on the wounds, but I have to share this one with you because it's so freaking cool. Um, humans, VA hospital chronic wounds, they treated them for three weeks, twice a day, Monday through Friday. The patients that had the active therapy had a 64% reduction in the size of the wounds. The patients that had a non-active device were the same or worse. That's cool. Okay, let's look at loops. You can get them in 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter. The little orange packages mean they're on demand. You push the button, it goes on for 15 minutes, it shuts off, and you can use it one to four times a day. I usually go more if it's more um, intense issues or I need a quicker effect. If I have clients that work like 10 hours a day, don't tell them to do it four times a day. It's not going to happen. Um, tell them to do it twice a day before work, after work, uh, if they need more once before bed. Um, they guarantee 150 uses. I had one client who actually did little check marks and got about 190 uses. The gray box is the one that you do, okay, hey, I've got a dog who just had a thoracotomy. I just had back surgery. You push the button, you put it in a, a bandage, and it's on every 15 minutes, every two out, four 15 minutes, every two hours until it dies. And it has at least 100 treatments in there. So you don't have to go back and push the button. So great for big surgeries. Oh, things to think about. I like just the visual of knowing what the field looks like. Um, you can use it for chronic issues, acute issues, surgical issues. A lot of times I have like my, my wobblers dogs, I'll send them home with it and say, you know what, you're going on a walk, you're going to the park, throw it on before, throw it on two hours later, or when you get home. And this way we're gonna decrease inflammation before it happens and then right away so we don't wait until we have stiffness or cervical issues. Comes in pads, so we have our little, our extra small, which fits in this guy. These are really great. Um, this is sleepy pod and the, the CC pads fit in there. So you can have a patient in there. Uh, I know several vets who every cat that comes in the clinic goes in their little pad and they get zipped up waiting for the vet. And when the vet gets in there, it's a calmer, happier cat um, than meow. Um, they have a slightly bigger one. So this is a small, it's that size, which is this one, plus a little bit on the end. And yes, that is active treatment going up. That's the size I had for my dachshund. 
um, and I would put him in twice a day for cognitive dysfunction, um, for pain, inflammation. Oop, wait. And then this picture you can see, you can put it at home. This is Roxy. This is on the SCC lounge. So this is a Clinica. Um, so it's thin, great for in the clinic. It's 28, I'm sorry, 18 by 36 inches. Um, I put my patients on it while I'm doing my exam and my history. Uh, I take them off of it while I'm doing laser, if I'm doing laser. Uh, and CC has come out with now one that's that size, but thicker for clients so they can treat at home or even bigger, their uh, lounge, large, large lounge, 23 and a half by 32 and a half inches. So patients can be treated at home. Those devices have a cool battery that can be plugged in while you're using or not while you're using it and charge up and they guarantee the battery for 6,000 uses. That's pretty cool. And you don't have to wait two hours like you do in the loops between to have the battery recharge. So this is something that you can treat if you have a surgical suite, each patient as they come out, go boom, 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 boom. And my, a lot of my clients have multiple dogs. So they can come home from work and while they're cooking dinner, that dog goes on it. A lot of, I'm very spoiled. A lot of my patients are really well trained. So they can say, don't stay. 15 minutes later, okay, you're off. Here's a cookie, next dog on. Not everyone can do that, but clients can sit and watch TV with their dog too. CC Loop Aid is like a little bodysuit that they can put on and uh, use Velcro. So you can place it wherever you need it. Um, we don't want to go below the hocks or carpus because we don't want the dogs tripping on it. There is a wonderful little guide. I can say that because I helped write it. Um, and you can get to it uh, and just print out all the information so that your clients know how to use their CC loop. So this is what it looks like. It has the injury name, it has all the instructions, and then it has pictures on how to do it. There's more. Really cool. Uh, CC has done some research. Now this isn't all their research, this is other research, but using PEMF for decreasing inflammation in the brain and decreasing anxiety. And you can see here 2006, 2009, all the way up to 2017. This is an up and coming field and we have access to devices for these neurotic dogs. Now I say that lovingly. Um, this is a study done with the Calmer canine used in dogs with separation anxiety. So it's not for all kinds of anxiety, but the study was done with dogs just with severe to moderate to severe separation anxiety. So hypersalvation, destruction of property, excessive vocalization, injuries, pacing, house soiling. They put it on, they did videos before, they actually did a questionnaire first, and then videos. Said, yes, you are allowed to come into the study. Then they treated them for um, six weeks twice a day, eight hours apart. And they videoed them baseline, one hour or one week, two week, four week, six week. They took the devices away. And then two weeks later, they did it again. And what they found was within a week, more than half of the dogs had a decrease in separation anxiety. 100% um, of the case, it had, had a decrease in canine separation anxiety after a month of treatment. And 50% of the dogs had all signs of separation anxiety gone at six weeks and no side effects. Everything has precautions. Everything has precautions. So what do we need to think about with PEMF? Large amounts of steel. So a collar, no problem. A tag, no problem. If you have a metal cage, problem. If you have a metal table, problem. Um, you want to treat them away from metal. It's not going to like hurt the dog, it's just not gonna have consistent effects, right? So you don't wanna treat the dog in a cage or around a large amount of metal. If the owner or person treating the patient has a pacemaker or the dog has a pacemaker, we have to be careful. Dog has a pacemaker, don't use it. Find another modality. If the owner has a pacemaker, they say to have the, the pet either on the person's lap or lower. Personally, I would say lower. Uh, any electric equipment, you need to make sure that if you have oxygen tanks, um, 
you you need to you know anything that's electric could create a spark not that i've ever seen anything like that but all electric uh, devices have to have a precaution written about them let's go through some cases autumn is an 18 year old cat she was diagnosed with osteoarthritis three years ago. She had all kinds of rehab and was better, but not great. Um, started treating with the CC loop three times a day, and she is a whole new girl. So that's Autumn. Oz, urinary tract obstruction. How many times do we see that, right? Had been anesthetized, catheterized, had fluids. Two days later, she blocked again. Large bladder. They use the loop for 15 minutes, and this is not a guarantee that's gonna happen with everybody, but it decreases spasm. She started dribbling urine, and that was enough for them to say, hey, maybe we can express this bladder. Ding, 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 ding. Sure enough, she was able to express. Owner now uses it twice a day, no more obstruction. Now, she was also on some meds, so you know everything together, multimodal is a good thing, but if we can stop these, these tomcats from obstructing, that's an amazing thing. Cabo. Cabo came from a hoarder rescue. Chronic bilateral um, otitis and rhinitis. Every couple weeks would come in thick, yellow mucus, right? It would just nasty stuff coming out of its nose. We'd been treating with antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, would get better, and then it would start again. As soon as it got off the meds, within a few days, it would start again. Owner said, okay, we'll try the ACC loop and used it sporadically with minimal results. And we said, hey, you know what? Do it or don't do it. So they started using it three times a day, done. No more discharge, no more heavy sneezing. Cat is a happy, happy cat. Reuben, Reuben is close to my heart. He was my personal assistance dog. Um, you can see up here, he had the Assisi device around his neck. He was the one with the laryngeal paralysis. He had had five knee surgeries. She adopted him after five knee surgeries. Good person. Um, hip dysplasia with pain and loss of extension of his hips. He had elbow arthritis, loss of range of motion. Ma, uh, Ruben's mom, Laura, actually had multiple loops. You can see these are the old loops. We use them for years. So she could treat his elbows and his hips at the same time. If you're going to do that, you do need to make sure the loops are at least six inches away. But this way she could treat multiple areas with him. And then again, if you have to wait, rather than waiting two hours in between loops, she could use one here, one here. And then when those were done, she could treat the other side or do whatever she needed to do. She went everywhere. Here's Laura in the background. She'd kill me if she knew I had that picture with her in there, but that's okay. Um, he had breathing episodes, again, Chicago with laryngeal paralysis, and she would easily say it saved his life um, with, with the breathing issues. And this is him at his 15th birthday. We had him until he was 15 and a half with all of those issues. Fritz. Fritz, 18-year-old dachshund, had 11 teeth removed, um, obviously had the small loop around his face. Uh, two years later, had 14 teeth removed and again used it for his face. Had low, lower cervical pain. Literally, he was within a day, he was my dog, um, of surgery. I mean, I, again, all right, this is one of our cases where we say, what do I need to do? What can I learn from this? I had done, <laughs> okay, bitey piranidoxin, acupuncture, not really feasible chiropractic not helping he was not happy with it um, laser wasn't enough we started using the CC loop and I was literally like if he is not better by tomorrow I'm taking him to the neurologist we'll have the MRI we'll have the surgery we'll do whatever we need to do and we used it like every two hours and saw enough change in one day that we're like okay let's keep going with this other things we used it for anal gland issues because he's a dachshund um, I have pictures of him with his teeth. So you can see it here with his cervical issues. I did not think you needed to see it around his butt because nobody should have to have their butt shown. But that's my boy.
Kiss, Kiss was a, is a four-year-old, well, he's older now, competitive agility Sheltie, came to me with right medial shoulder instability with a biceps brachial uh, tendinopathy. He had a psoas strain on the right, really nasty gracilis trigger points, and his right carpus was painful and restricted. So he had a lot going on in both ends. We did laser. We did the CC loop constantly. Mom was very, very um, judicious in using the loop at home. She was really good about it. Uh, we got the, the iliopsoas strain resolved. We got the shoulder back to normal. Carpus is back to normal. Um, she still continues to use it on the gracilis before and after when she competes. And one of her quotes to me was, he did his double Q. So if you know um, AKC Agility, that's double qualifier, so masters and standard, in the fastest time that he has done in yards per second in over a year and a half, and he won his premier standard class. I love hearing that kind of stuff. So remember I talked about um, Jamie Gaynor, right? He is one of my heroes, one of my gurus for pain management. This is one of the papers, so feel free to take a picture of this, or you can go to the ACC website, and they have, uh, you can get access to this. Veterinary Applications of Pulse Electromagnetic Field Therapy. It's like eight, 10 pages. Um, it's a great read, great read, um, especially for nerds like me. And it, it's recent, right? It's 2018. Love it, love it. So in a nutshell, the way I see the ACC loop, it reduces pain, increases mobility, improves circulation, accelerates healing, reduces swelling, it has no dangerous side effects, and big one is opioid sparing. And I will open it up to questions. Okay, and we have them. <laughs> uh, one, uh, first question, in the studies with post-op IVDD surgery, were the outcomes different with the use of PEMF? Um, so with both of them, I don't know that they looked at walking versus non-walking. I don't think that changed. I know that didn't change. I know that um, proprioception was better in one of them. And I would have to go back to the slide to see which one looked at, pro only one of them looked at proprioception. Um, pain was huge. Um, wounds, but I don't think they looked at or there was no change in. They certainly didn't say in the study walking versus non-walking as an endpoint um, was different. Okay. Uh, can you put a loop inside the lining of a regular cat to treat cystitis in cats at home? In the lining of a regular cat. In the carrier, I get okay. it. In a cat so bed. you yeah. could put it in a carrier, absolutely, as long as your cat is going through it. So again, think about from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky if you're in a hang five sign, right? So if the cat is through it, just wear it like a hula hoop, right? The carrier just makes it easier. I've used it in, like think of an Elizabethan collar. I've used it in those for the dogs that I can just tape it to, have the owner just push the button, and this way, if they've had, um, whether it be a ear hematoma or dental surgery or anything relating to the face, tumor removal, um, uh, eye ulcer, anything like that, you can use. So certainly, you can put it in a carrier as long as it is stable. You don't want it to go like sideways because then the cat might not be getting the treatment. You need to just have the owner hold the loop Many times I've had owners hold it, um, whether it be like a halo for around the head or neck, uh, for like smaller border collies, shelties, you can bring it around the back feet and the tail and put it like a hula hoop that way. Um, you can treat the lungs like that, you can treat the spine like that, you can treat the pancreas, your stomach, your colon, all of that stuff. So yes. Okay, another question. There's lots of them. I have a patient with laryngeal paralysis and a mild seizure disorder. Would you hesitate to use PEMF around the neck of a dog with seizures? I would not, not at all. 
Um, I'm not going to say that it's going to have an effect. I haven't seen any studies on it with seizure patients, but if its job, if its um, mode of action is to decrease inflammation, I don't see anything that would cause an increase in seizure activity. Uh, you mentioned dental extractions, but what about stomatitis? Absolutely. Um, again, that's one of those cases that I would laser when they're in the clinic. I know lots of vets who, with their cats, will laser them um, twice a week until they get to controlled. It usually takes about a month. And then go to once a week for a month, and then every other week for a month, and then stay on once a month treatment for stomatitis. And then the owners can use the CC loop at home. What about bone plates and screws and tracheal stents? Awesome. Um, I can't tell you that it's going to go through the metal, but it's, the metal's not going to hurt. So that means if I have like a, a TPLO and my metal plate is on the uh, medial aspect, I would either put it on the lateral aspect or put it like a hula hoop around the knee, right? So if you, if you have a client who needs it simple, put it on the lateral aspect, right? Because we don't know that it's going to go through the plate. So I wouldn't put it on the medial aspect. Um, and we want the bone to heal. Uh, but if you put it like a hula hoop, it's not only treating that knee, but it's going up and down. So it's treating all the muscles. Uh, and I may get a little bit nerdy on you, but when I think of cruciate, remember it is the quadriceps, the, um, the sartorius, the, um, the gracilis, the gastrocnemius, all of those muscles play into how that knee uses the muscles to support the knee and prevent the rotation and shear force. So I want to be treating all of those, not just the joint itself. So if you wear it like a hula hoop, it, it treats seven inches up or, or more and seven inches down. So you can get most of those muscles. Um, whereas if you just put it on the side, now granted, if that's all your client can handle, that's fine. But if you just put it on the side, you get that um, seven inches about of treatment area straight through but you don't get as much up and down. What percentage of dogs with Lepar that use the ACC loop go on to need surgery compared to dogs that do not use the loop? Have not seen a, um, any studies on it. Would love to see a study on it. Uh, I, like I said, I do know that Laura was on the, uh, and this may be a little embarrassing for me to share, but Laura was on the blog with her dog and came to me, and again, this was years ago, and said, hey, listen, these people on the blog, these clients, these lay people are talking about this PEMF device. We have those, don't we? Can I use that for Ruben? <laughs> and I had to look it up and go, yeah, let's try it. And she, like I said, there were at least a dozen times where she, it, she says that it helped save her dog's life because it went from <laughs> with the strider to being able to breathe easier, staying outside in Chicago in the summer. Okay. When you list all the things we can treat with the ACC loop, do you mean the pain and inflammation for these conditions? The loop is not going to fix surgical problems, correct? Oh, absolutely. It's not going to fix your cruciate, right? But will it make it heal faster after surgery? Yes. If, it's, if they're not going to have surgery, will it, will it help with decrease in inflammation? Yeah. Is it going to stop the shear force and the rotation? No, not at all. Um, so it, use it for what it's intended for, right? So even the lower part, right? It, it may be that the dog is going to need the, the tie back surgery, right? It's for when they have the inflammation and if they have pain. Okay, what limits the number of treatments you can get with a loop? Does the magnetic field weaken? The magnetic field weakens the farther out from the loop. So remember that barrel shape, um, it goes out, it weakens the further and further from the loop. It, the more time, the more times you use it, the batteries weaken, right? So it, and it goes from blinking once every second, I'm sorry, once every two seconds, when the batteries get low, it starts blinking once every two seconds. So I, I sorry, I said that backwards. It goes from, blinking, blinking, blinking to blink, 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 blink. And then you know your battery's low 
and you need to get another one. Um, and when it's, if it is blinking at all, it means it's on. When it stops blinking, it means the machine's off. And you can get a little card. CC has those little cards that you can put in the center and it'll tell you, it'll blink when it, when it, when it feels the, um, perceives the magnetic field. So you can tell from that too. Could someone please clarify this? My understanding as of two months ago of waiting two hours between the 15 minute treatments on a dog is not for the battery in the traditional Assisi loop to recharge, but to allow nitrous oxide in the patient's body to return to normal levels so that additional therapy with the loop will be effective. Great, great question. Let's clarify that. If you want to get at least 150 uses out of your Assisi loop, you want to wait two hours in between uses. So I treated, when I was sick as a dog, forgive the pun, um, I didn't care about battery life. At that point, I needed to get out of bed and have a life rather than just sit miserable in a bed. So I treated my nose and then I treated three areas on my chest. I decreased the battery life, okay? So if you want the most uh, effect out of that, you want to wait two hours and let the battery recharge a little bit. Also, coincidentally, having nothing to do with that is when you turn the Assisi loop on and it goes for 15 minutes and it has an effect in the tissue, it starts a cascade reaction that lasts for about two hours. So treating an area, say I'm driving and my knee's stiff, I throw my loop on my knee and it's for, done with 15 minutes, and I say, wow, my knee is, is better, but it's not 100%, maybe I'll do it again, that is a useless waste of my CC loop. It is not gonna give me any more treatment once I have turned that on. Um, I can take my loop and wait two hours and do it again, um, but it, yeah, I, I, the two hours is kind of confusing because it's both two hours, but totally, totally different. Okay. How would you use the CC loop for intermittent pancreatitis? Um, so we're looking at a case by case basis. So if I have a pet that, um, gosh, every time they get into the garbage, they're going to get sick. As soon as I see them in the garbage, I'm going to use it. And I would probably use it four times a day for two or three days, right? Hit it head on. Um, if it's a case where I don't know what the inciting cause is, my dog looks funny at a meal, I'm gonna use it for a day or two. Same kind of thing. Um, if it's a case that every Sunday he gets sick, I'm gonna use it on Sundays. If it's a case of, yeah, every month, every six weeks, every eight weeks he has a problem and I don't know when it's gonna happen, you wait till he looks sideways at a meal um, or he's, just ain't doing right, and, and then you start it. And realize, if it's a, a, if you can catch it early, you might be able to get away with using it for a couple days. But if you use it for a couple days and you stop and he starts showing signs again, start again. It may take longer. Every patient's different. Find out what works best for that patient. Can the CC loop be used safely on a pregnant bitch? That is a great question, and just like everything from Tylenol to um, opioids. No one's going to do a study on that. So I would have no problem. In fact, somebody actually just asked me that question and I looked it up um, for a goat that was pregnant that had a, a knee injury. If you want to put it on the knee and it's not going from end of your thumb to the end of your pinky, that barrel shaped field is not going anywhere near the fetus. I have no problem with that. If you are pointing it in toward the fetus, we don't know. And I would not want your patient to give us the answer just for safety reasons, just because we don't know. Now, if it was the patient where you say, listen, this is life or death. If this animal can't get better, we're going to lose the patient and the baby, right? Then it's uh, informed consent. If you use it one time post-op, will it have an effect or do you need to use it multiple times? Great question. Um, uh, it has an effect. Absolutely, it has an effect. It's not going to be as good as if you use it three times a day or, you know, send them home with it, but does it have an effect? Absolutely. Okay. Um, 
here is one that says, uh, uh, Lori, FYI, it is okay to use the loop in PTS with pacemakers if it's away from the PM or leads by 10 inches. Have experience with this in a relative who had terrible back pain and a PM, Tim Crow. Oh, PM. awesome. I know. Can you comment Thanks, Tim. on the doubling technique where the loop is doubled over and then laid in the area that needs help? Oh, gosh, Tim, you probably have more experience with that than I do. Um, feel free to type in a message. That. <laughs> yeah, when I think of, I know that when you have your small loop, your field, how far out it goes, um, is like half the distance. So I don't usually twist it and turn it over just because I have less of an effect. If I want a smaller area, I'd use a small loop. I would always rather get more of an effect and say wasted effect Be using a big loop than a small loop. I usually use the small loops if you have like, like you saw with my, um, my dachshund, right? Because it fit really well around his neck. It fit really well to when I was treating his, where he had his extractions. Um, that's when I use a small loop. Okay, uh, and a last question for this session, but I am going to let you know that the slides will be made available to you along with your CE certificates and that if you uh, reply to us at customer service, you will get answers to anything we were not able to answer in today's timeline. This is the last question. Hi, Lori. I met you a few years ago. You gave us lectures at Coral Springs. Are you Yay. referring to a class four? or class 3B laser? The laser that I use is a low level class four laser. So it does not create heat. Um, I am not a big proponent of heat on heat. I think all lasers have an effect. Um, I like mine because I can have a big effect without worrying about creating heat. Um, you know, and that's that's a whole nother lecture, you know, on frequencies and wavelengths and power, um, just like the CC versus the bone stimulator versus the diathermy, using different variables have different physiologic effects in the tissue. But the laser I'm talking about is a low level class four laser. Okay, that brings our presentation to a close for today. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. Again, you will get the slides with your certificate and uh, we will be more than happy to answer any questions that you care to forward to us. Hey, Carolyn, yes. I know last time we did this, if people had thought of other questions, because I know I do that all the time, I wake up after hearing something at three in the morning going, crap, I should have asked. Yes. Um, if they, I know last time, people could type in their questions and then after about a week of you gathering them, you sent them to me, I wrote out answers for everything and then everybody got them emailed back so that they could all learn from it. Is that something you want to do again this time? We most definitely could do that. Okay, awesome. Okay, everyone is saying thank you, Lori. Oh, you're welcome. My screen Hi, is everybody. lighting up with thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks everyone, keep your eye on what we're doing in CE. We will keep you posted uh, as to the rest of April and we've already got wonderful speaking assignments. Lori's coming back in Yay. May as well. So thank you very much. Take care everybody, stay safe, stay healthy.